Should executives from Cambridge Analytica have gone to prison? Should Mark Zuckerberg, should he be prosecuted? My name is Brittany Kaiser. I'm a data rights activist, and I'm also executive chairman of Griffin Digital Mining. I'm at Web Summit to not just talk about the problems of the big data industry, but the solutions and how large scale blockchain technologies and other types of privacy and data protection solutions can actually help solve a lot of these issues. And so it's about three years, I think, since you kind of blew the whistle on uh, what was going on with Cambridge Analytica and obviously their misuse, abuse, um, illegal, some would say, um, use of data. So how do you get from, you know, working in Cambridge Analytica, blowing the whistle on that to, to where you are now as a, a data rights activist? And um, what's this, the path that you took? Well, I think it actually starts a lot earlier than that. When I was studying as a human rights lawyer at Edinburgh University, I actually took time away from university to join the first Obama campaign in 07, 08, and was on the team that first invented social media strategy. So we were the first team to use data off of Facebook for political targeting. But on that campaign, I saw it as a positive thing. We were registering more people to vote than had ever been registered to vote before, getting people involved in their communities and political issues that affected their families. And I saw that as a net positive. So I got excited to join Cambridge Analytica to learn how to use these tools for a lot of the positive impact initiatives I had been working on. And unfortunately, found out that not everyone in the industry is a good actor and that Data is so highly unregulated that most companies like Cambridge Analytica or Facebook, many places in the world didn't actually have a lot of data protection regulations to stop them from breaking a lot of the laws that we actually already have. So everything from voter suppression to incitement of violence to other ways of violating people's human rights and human right to privacy especially all came up as issues while I was there, which is why I decided to become a whistleblower and in the end use my human rights experience to start campaigning for change. So you mentioned regulation quite a bit there and you're, and you're talking about data rights and, and, and regulation there. So what is you know, the solution to this? Right now, we're about to be producing even exponentially more data than we already are as we move into a world of Internet of Things, IoT, smart cities, artificial intelligence and advanced predictive analytics. So when we see the problems that we already have in the data industry, we must expect that these problems are going to get worse unless we cut to the root of the problem, which I see it in a few different ways. Firstly, education and awareness, people actually being digitally literate enough to understand how to protect themselves while using technology. Secondly, legislation and regulation, a lot of countries around the world still don't have comprehensive data protection or privacy legislation, including the United States of America. So there's a lot of work to be done at a top-down government level. But lastly, it's really the technologies that we're using. We need to be using technologies that allow for transparency, real informed consent, permission structures so that we can choose where our data is going and who's using it or not. And of course, my favorite conversation, which is data ownership, that if people are going to be monetizing it, that we are also able to use the value of our data for ourselves. So, I mean, your foundation is called Own, Own Your Data, um, and you mentioned data ownership there. So what does that look like? How do we, how do we turn, take the monetization of data that these companies like Facebook are, are you know, making huge amounts of money from our data? And how do we get some of that money? How do we get that back to ourselves? So really, it's about making sure that the back end architecture of a lot of the data that we're using is encrypted, mm -hmm. is enabled with data protection standards that allows us to use our digital identity and protect our personally identifiable information while sharing a lot of anonymized data sets that can be incredibly useful to governments, to companies, to researchers. And through that process, all of the data we ever produce will be connected back to our anonymized ID. And everywhere that it's actually being monetized, whether it's healthcare researchers creating new medicines or smart cities trying to make sure that we don't have the next traffic accident, uh, all of those are monetizable. And we'd be able to decide if we wanted to plug in our data 
into those algorithms that are actually solving real world problems and get our tiny piece of the pie, which might not mean a lot to some of the people attending Web Summit a couple dollars a day, but mm. there are billions of people around the world that live on less than that each day. And that's completely life changing for a big portion of the planet. We are at, at, at Web Summit. Frances Hogan spoke on, uh, on Monday evening. Um, she's a whistleblower. She just recently blew the whistle. Um, so she's going through a lot of what you went through three years ago. What is it like to, to be a whistleblower and to, to suddenly be thrown into the, the spotlight like that? To be a whistleblower is probably one of the hardest positions that any individual could ever be faced with, which is that you have a crisis of conscience is what a lot of people describe it as, where you feel like even though what you're about to do is dangerous. You don't know what's going to happen to you or your family. You don't know if you're ever going to be able to work again, maybe blacklisted from many different industries, or you might even lose your right to travel, mm -hmm. or people might even come and try to arrest you to pin something on you. A lot of whistleblowers end up in a very bad situation, actually. You decide to take that leap anyway because you know that if you don't, you'll never be able to live with yourself, that the information that you have could help make change and it's worth taking that risk no matter what's going to happen to you. So uh, I think for her especially, having been an insider at Facebook and having had the time to collect and prove everything that she wanted to say that yeah, she's had such an incredible opportunity to be able to well organize her thoughts, make sure she had all of the evidence to prove that and hopefully we'll actually see regulators taking action on a lot of the issues that Chris Wiley and myself brought up as whistleblowers in 2018, mm -hmm. where we supposed that Facebook was doing certain things and now she's been able to come out and prove that. Mm -hmm. That's a really big deal. It was actually really emotional for me to watch her testimony. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so happy that when I think a lot of these conversations were losing a bit of momentum when everyone's been stuck in technology, 24 seven during the coronavirus shutdown that now we're coming out, we're opening up and we have again, these testimonies about the issues at Facebook that have not gotten better in the past three and a half years. So we need to be holding tech executives feet to the fire and say, how much are you investing in these solutions? And if you don't, the regulators are going to force you to invest in these solutions because it's not possible or sustainable for us to continue with these issues. You, know, you mentioned holding executives feet to the fire. Um, and I think you've answered this question before in the past, but should executives from Cambridge Analytica have gone to prison? Um, and actually then you know, let's bring it forward now to you know, what we now know Facebook knew and carried on with the um, information that Francis has brought to light. Should Mark Zuckerberg go? Should he resign? Should he be prosecuted? Um, I know you believe in, I think, in executive uh, liability for these things. So. What do you think? Should people have gone to prison three years ago? Should they go now? Should Mark resign? Absolutely. I'm actually a big supporter of us moving from civil liability for a violation of data protection to criminal liability. I think at this point, when you look at the number of criminal laws in countries around the world that get broken on platforms like Facebook, we need to start thinking about how how we can hold people accountable for that and, and what that actually looks like. And if you manage to violate people's right to vote, if you manage to implement voter suppression campaigns, if you are allowing the incitement of violence and racial hatred, in most countries we have laws that hold criminal liability about all of these issues. And yet on a daily basis, we're seeing these laws being broken on Facebook again and again. And the individuals that put up that content are not being held accountable, and then that content is being amplified by the platform, then the platform becomes liable for that. And so moving from civil liability, where mm -hmm. you can even give Facebook a $5 billion fine and they put it into the cost of doing business, to criminal liability, where executives like Mark Zuckerberg would actually be liable to go to jail if they continue to allow this to happen, that's where we're actually going to see a change. And there are a couple countries that are considering legislation like this, but we're not there yet. We mm -hmm. still see these small fines and therefore it's harder to hold companies to account. And therefore it's harder to expect that our data protection rights are going to be respected. 
you're you're more well known probably for you know blowing the whistle and your work around uh, data rights. But I know you're also very excited about blockchain and crypto. So I want to ask you, you know, uh, you mentioned it. Is it Griffin Mining ne mm -hmm. uh, Network? C can you tell us what that is, what you do with it, and where it's going? Absolutely. So I'm the executive chairman of Griffin Digital Mining. We are the world's first carbon neutral, or shall I say carbon negative Bitcoin mining company. And we are building large scale infrastructure to make sure that blockchain technologies can be sustainable, especially in this large period of growth that we're seeing right now. We're seeing large adoption around the world of encryption technologies that enable data protection, that enable faster payments or you know affordable remittances to actual data ownership protocols and tracking and traceability and auditability for data management, making sure that these emerging technologies have the ability to grow globally, have the ability to be sustainable. And you saw everyone from Elon Musk to Jack Dorsey, the Winklevoss twins, Kevin O'Leary, talking this year about the need for blockchain technologies and the industry in general to become more sustainable while we are the first actor in the space to say we are going to use 100% renewable and carbon neutral energy. And then on top of that, be ESG focused. The blockchain industry is now a multi-trillion dollar industry. And so we have the ability to start investing billions of dollars into sustainable data centers and infrastructure, where I think it's actually possibly uh, possible to show that we are, as technologists, one of the best partners that climate change activists and that regulators could possibly look to, to making sure that there's enough investment in large scale renewable and sustainability solutions. So that is one of the, you know, one of the big criticisms a lot of the time of crypto and blockchain is the mining process mm -hmm. is very energy intensive and that has sustainability problems. So how have you managed to, to be a successful Bitcoin mining operation and be sustainable? How have, how have you done that? Firstly, by committing to all of our first deployments being at 100% renewable facilities, we're using a lot of hydroelectric specifically, and now we're also moving into nuclear. We use absolutely no fossil fuels, so all of our operations are carbon neutral from the beginning. And then on top of that, we're investing in reforestation, carbon capture, and carbon credits that are actually supporting the large-scale development of renewable facilities. And so... Being carbon neutral and doing more than that allows us to be carbon negative as an organization, but also allows us to be a financial partner for climate change solutions where a lot of other industries are not actually investing at that level. Thank you. I think Absolutely. we're probably coming to the end of our time. So I'm just going to say uh, thank you very much, Brittany, for sitting down with me. Thank you for being here at Web Summit again. I think this is your, this your is second, third, third yeah. one. Um, so thank you for being here. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back next year. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me again. Again, incredible experience. I always love being here. It's just so invigorating. Like it renews my passion for everything that I'm doing and to meet so many like-minded individuals. So thank you for being incredible hosts. And I look forward to seeing you guys again next year.